Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 329th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Jerome Reyes and Jessamine Batario. We're also thrilled to have the poet Farnoosh Fatih here, who will read to close today's program. We have started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second, the second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Uh, but now to introduce today's guest and host, uh, art historian Justin Batario specializes in modern and contemporary art. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Patario currently lives in Waterville, Maine, where she is the Lind Family Foundation Curator of Academic Engagement at the Colby College Museum of Art. Artist, researcher, and educator Jerome Reyes works with the collaborative potentials of institutions, alterity, and architecture. He is artist liaison and faculty at Stanford University's Institute for Diversity in the Arts, teaching courses and designing partnerships with artists, curators, scholars, and organizations. Without further ado, the mic is yours, Jessamine. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, uh, Fong, especially in the Brooklyn Rail for having us here. It's always good to be back. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us for this conversation. I'm really excited to be um, sharing the screen, I guess you could say, with uh, my friend, Jerome Reyes. Uh, I do want to say that um, I'm speaking to you from Maine, uh, what is now, uh, or what is now Maine, this is the ancestral homelands of the Wabanaki, that consists of the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseite, the Passamaquoddy, and uh, the Penobscot. And uh, Jerome is uh, coming here from San Francisco, uh, but before I get to Jerome, uh, Nick, could you show the slides, please? That's, uh, so what you're seeing there, that's me and Jerome, uh, just recently about uh, some few weeks ago in San Francisco in front of his billboard called Abeyance that we'll be talking about later today. And really my relationship with Jerome kind of was really born out of the pandemic. Um, I wrote about and I presented a paper at the College Art Association Conference, uh, CAA, about this work, Abeyance, that's in, in the background. And because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel. So I was stuck writing about something that I hadn't seen in person. Uh, which is very difficult to do, which you probably shouldn't do if you're an art historian, but I did it because of the pandemic. And uh, so what got me through that actually was that I reached out to Jerome and just had a lot of really great and fruitful conversations about this work and that I was able to present uh, in that way. So um, what uh, we kind of hit it off immediately through all those conversations and it took over a year, but we finally met in person. And uh, we probably hit it off because of our California connections. Uh, I grew up in California. I also went to school in the Bay Area where Jerome is now, um, did my undergrad at Berkeley and he's now at Stanford. And um, so today we're going to talk kind of loosely about his artistic practice. Uh, as Nick said, he's a, also uh, very invested in art education and pedagogy. His work is uh, what you could call site responsive. Uh, it, it's often in public places. Uh, his practice is also characterized by uh, being intergenerational, uh, transdisciplinary, and cross-institutional. So very, very big thinker here. And uh, that practice is really rooted in relationship building. Uh, so it's no wonder that um, a big part of, of, of what we experienced over the year was really just talking to each other and establishing a relationship, a friendship, uh, to keep this work going. And uh, so his work is also installation, uh, involves text, as you can see, uh, time-based media, public events, and long-term uh, pedagogical initiatives. Uh, so today we're going to be sharing Jerome's work. It's kind of a fitting moment to do so because very recently Rutledge just published a book uh, called Public Space, Context Contested Space, in which there's a chapter uh, looking back on Jerome's practice over the last 20 years. 
And so 20 years of artistic practice is uh, kind of a big deal because Jerome isn't even that old. So 20 years actually starts when he was 18. Um, and so I think it's a fantastic opportunity to take a look back at all of that. Um, a lot of that work is rooted in uh, California's Bay Area history, particularly going back to the 1960s and 70s. And so I think maybe that's a good place to start our conversation, Jerome, is uh, if you can talk about kind of that historical context and how that informs a large part of your, your work. Uh, I know that um, you're very much interested in the formation of an ethnic studies department at universities and colleges uh, across the country. And that really began in California in the late 60s. And it's, it's ongoing today. I mean, I just recently read an article that Fordham is trying to get an Asian American studies department going. And so uh, it's still very much uh, top of mind in, in many universities. So let's, let's start with that context actually, Jerome, for contact points and where it all began. Thank you. Thank you, Jessamyn. Um, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone, uh, Jessamine, um, Nick, Fong, Catherine, everyone at the rail. Uh, this is such a pleasure, um, really. I've been looking forward to this for a really long time. And I wanted to respectfully acknowledge I'm speaking from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. Uh, if this uh, were a different moment past COVID, I may have been speaking from Seoul, South Korea, which is my second home, but I get to talk from my first home here on the other coast of uh, this nation. So it's just, again, this is going to be really fun. And just I mean, that was such a great introduction because I was thinking that how impossible it is to talk about 20 years of projects, but really 20 years of life in this brief conversation. But what's nice in the book where Nick is putting wonderful links. Um, you can see this book here. Please grab it. It's incredible. It was made last year during this time, really thinking about contested space and the formations of different bodies and organizations, how people work with this ongoing question of who gets to live here, who gets to stay here, who gets to choose to stay here. And with that, I work a lot with legacies and with people that are still alive doing the good work and people who are institution building as kids. And that's why I was fortunate enough and I was thinking when I was writing that book chapter that I was surrounded growing up by many of these people who were working in the long 60s as student activists, as artists, as people who were also enjoying their lives, racing cars, starting film groups. They were photographers, musicians. And a wonderful uh, document I want to show of many archives and boxes that I have because, frankly, they were hoarders. Um, this is a Third World Studies folder as part of the Contact Points project I will be talking about now, where I'm looking at all these archives. But then I found this, one of many papers, I don't know if you can see it, but one of the original designs of what those programs would look like. And you can see here, it says Contemporary Asian Art and Artists. And it was incredible because it doesn't even say art history. They were thinking of what is contemporary art? What does that add? To the understanding of what it means to live in this country, have parents who are immigrants, and the fact they were thinking about that in the late 60s, early 70s, really as young students when envisioning what the rest of the world could become, is just this extraordinary act of retrieval that I'm doing now, that really looking at the future, we're looking deeply and ferociously into the past simultaneously in that way. So uh, next slide, Nick. Um, I want to talk about contact points, which is one of the longest running projects that I've done in my life. And really, it's focused on a struggle that happened, but more so a legacy of living in, in the anti-eviction movement that happened in San Francisco. Uh, next slide. Great. So. Here, contact points, as Jessamine brought up, I wanted to show you the night of August 4th, 1977 here, which is where contact points really started. And what you're looking at here is the first international hotel located at the pivot of Chinatown or Manila Town, North Beach and the Financial District in San Francisco. And here, the lar largest cross alliance coalition organized around the corner of Jackson and Kearney, and Kearney Street in solidarity to prevent the eviction of elderly immigrant tenants. 
And these are thousands of people. And these causes included Yellow Power, the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, the Third World Liberation Front, all towards the anti-eviction movement embodied by this human chain. So in collaboration with uh, who's really like my older sister, uh, soul-based artist scholar Kamiko Robinson, contact points was a tree strategy to call allies during crisis where there were no cell phones or pagers or whatnot. So for example, if someone found out the eviction was gonna happen, Jessamine would have five people to call. Let's, let's say one of those were Nick. She would call those five people and she would have four others and Nick would have five people. And amazingly, within a few hours, they assembled 3,000 plus people from around the Bay Area to defend this building. And that's where the idea came from. Who do you call? Who do you ask for help? Uh, next slide, please. So I, I wanna, I'm gonna use my uh, Stanford teaching voice and Jessamine was making fun of me during this time. Um, this will set the base for everything we talk about, so bear with me, but I wanted to briefly show these, she's smiling, these uh, four points that really ground, I realized pretty much everything I do and working site responsive, working intergenerationally, all of those people, they don't get tired. They just keep working, but they have the time of their lives in that way. So as Jessamine was saying in the 1960s, and looking at the long 60s. In 1968, the U.S. landscape was comprised of conditions, including the growing anti-Vietnam War movement, the impact of the Civil Rights Movement, and the U.S. Continue, continued occupation of Native lands. Two is people, and a linkage was forged between many first-generation college students enrolled at SF State and UC Berkeley, Jessamine's alma mater, uh, between March and October of 1968, and they insisted on a meaningful curriculum connecting colleges and communities, but especially the elderly migrant residents who were living in the hotel who became targets, and really San Francisco's modern history as a city with all these different flows of capital. And speaking of that three, historically, the SF Bay Area was a testing ground in architectural design and urban planning, really aiming to secure its place as one of three finance cities stabilizing itself against the effects of these very and various power movements that ushered US capitalism into crisis post-World War II. So when you think of San Francisco, uh, Chicago, and New York, they would come to impress the armature capitalism in terms in regards to banking services, uh, futures, and stock exchange. And here, most pertinent uh, to the slide, you see uh, dates. So March 1968, SF, SF State's Third World College or Third World Liberation Front forms among students of color. Uh, a lot of the materials in the folder I just showed you. Um, around the same time in that same milieu within the city, October 28, 1968, the first eviction notice was served on 196 international hotel tenants, low-income housing, given the first of uh, January 1969 to leave. Across the Bay, January 21, 1969, you see Berkeley's third world strike begin. So again, the Bay's on fire, stuff is going down, people are deciding where to live. All these heavy ideas have the energy of young student activists. Uh, next slide, Nick. And this is who they were fighting for. So here you see Wahat Tampao on the left, uh, one of the elderly Filipino tenants in front of a sign and a wonderful typography that says, we won't move, a slogan that has been said in New York, San Francisco, all across Asia. And his friend and fellow activist and resident at the hotel, Felix Eisen, with a supporter. And these were the migrant tenants that a lot of the young people befriended and came to learn about their past in that time, where again, institutions were being built. Ideas where people were deserving to learn about themselves were being tested at Berkeley and SF State. Uh, next slide. So here, this is what that building looked like at the pivot of those three districts and Jackson and Kearney. And what you see here, and I recommend you look at the links in the chat of an amazing volume of, of research, of, of writing, of critical writing, the novel by Karen Tayamashu, The I Hotel Legacy is one that cannot be summarized in an hour. There's an amazing movie by a friend, Curtis Troy, called The I Hotel. So what here really is an entryway to such a rich moment in movement history within the United States, along with Asian American history. So what was nice about this moment was that there was an open pit that was a wound that reminded the city, this is really what you do to people who deserve to live here. So the image, the archival image by Nancy Wong on the left of that corner, that building that was demolished. On the right, you actually see me many lives ago with much less hair. Uh, this is me recovering two tons of brick. Yes, Jessamine, that's me. I did um, not realize that was you when I first saw these slides. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's me. So like when, when I take the archival research thing seriously and I don't drive, like I took these bricks on the bus a hundred pounds at a time. That alone was a piece in itself, but I actually have two tons of the building, which is made around the 1906 earthquake. They're in my backyard. If we have time, we can go see it. But uh, this is the material that you work with of living people, of centuries old materials, of documents. And that's really where the fun begins and also Jessamine's uh, questions of many questions over the past year of what contact points was and how I really addressed such an irreducible asymmetrical symphonic history and how to even address that. So uh, next slide. So Jessamine would often ask me like, what is this uh, five platform project? And what you see here is that same corner, miraculously, many, many years later, almost 30 years later, and this is the new iHotel located on the same corner where the long game was fought and won, where organizers basically got a new hotel for low-income housing, senior housing. And I was like, oh my God, this is the perfect place to do a project based on this site. But having an exhibition wasn't enough, having programs wasn't enough, and the space was not a gallery, it was a senior center. So what better architectural situation to start playing with and to really honor, but also extend this history to a lot of different iHotels happening in the world. Housing and the sheer velocity to development in urban cities is something that you can point to many different places around the world. Even when I live in Seoul, like I see how quickly cities can erase itself and change. So I want to go to the next slide, um, thinking of five platforms, five platforms as uh, different systems I had to work through to exhaust a lot of these different concepts and ideas that were happening. Uh, so platform one, uh, site responsive exhibition, as uh, Jessamine uh, called it. And Jessamine, please feel free to jump in and uh, throw your thoughts. Um, but here, uh, this is the slicking, uh, this is the slickest looking senior center you're going to see. Uh, we brought, we bought them a ten thousand dollar hardwood floor, uh, thousands of dollars of lights. Uh, it was their normal place to do tai chi, ballroom dancing, bingo, uh, feed them. I'm not going to parachute myself in and make it a contemporary art show. I had to actually learn how to run a senior center at the same time. So the standards of running that, um, I was like borderline accredited because I had to like run through all the programs, like how to manage everything while still having the metrics and the, the placement of it as a contemporary art show at the same time. So that said, uh, next slide. Um, Jessamine, jump in. I yeah. You might go before, yeah, before you before you go deeply into this particular work, um, and the fact that you're talking about, you know, how you had to work with a lot of these seniors who live there now, and I know you do so much of this, like you're just so integrated into the community. A lot of your practice involves collaboration and community engagement. Uh, so in short, what you're doing is really you're building relationships with people. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about that, about the process of, you know, trust is a big important part of, of, of building a relationship. How do you establish trust and how does that play out? That's a, that, that's a fun question because like I think in the way, well, one, it's like I have this like, for me at least, like I don't tell someone how to be my friend. You spend time, you go eat, you joke around, you find out what they're working on, you find out what they really believe in. And, and something that I like to say about the Bay Area, um, and I get distance living in Seoul to think about these things. Um, what's really beautiful is that I really understand how I'm American when I'm on the other side of the world outside of the West. And I really get time away from being all my different identities here. And I realize that here, a lot of the communities I work with have archivists, they have teachers, they have institution builders. There's different families, uh, really polyvocal communities already doing legacy level work multiple decades before I even step in, before they, I even know who they are. So I have to acknowledge that once or even before I go in. And I think from there, I have to look at it. Um, and Jessamine, it's perfect because you're a PhD. Like you have to look historiographically where are the gaps, what work hasn't been done yet. It, it takes me years to even find out where any gaps exist because they're the best people. They're so good. And even with this project here uh, in this slide, one of the activists um, 
the professor emeritus at San Jose, Estela Habal, who in sociology, who was one of the youngest activists, one of the key leaders, one of the super strong uh, young women in that movement who wrote the history book of I Hotel. Uh, she was with Wahat Tampao, the gentleman who was sitting in front of that text you saw a couple slides earlier. And there's this beautiful story that she told me where the eviction is happening, people are being dragged out, and they're in the very last room. Everyone's crying and screaming, and she's like, oh my God, they're, they're going to take us, we might die. And he walks out of the room with a butterfly knife. And in the Philippines, like that, that's a knife he used to shank someone. So he clacks it, takes it out, walks outside. And she's like, oh my God. He, he, he's done for. And then he walks back in with a cantaloupe and he starts slowly cutting slices and he feeds everyone. And that is the last act of community before the seemingly last loss. Um, I can see in the chat, uh, the writer, a uh, historian, Dr. Estela Habal, H-A-B-A-L. So what was, again, the serendipitous kind of beautiful ways people emerged as this history was happening. I had this great friendship with Estela who lived five minutes from Stanford and she was hanging out in my studio. We were talking about this and we found the knife from that time and we shot a movie for installation across the street. So I'd like to show a segment of that. Um, Nick, next slide and next video. Thanks, Nick. You know, Jerome, I, got, I have to say that video, I've been thinking a lot about that video recently um, for a different thing, but um, it makes me think of like even just the art historical genre of still life and how, you know, um, usually you think of still life and art history as like, you know, a painting of fruit just like on a table or something, but that like just gives so much more meaning to it. Um, especially given that story, that background uh, that, you know, um, one of the residents began slicing cantaloupe like in a moment of like deep distress, like in the night of being evicted, at, at the, on the precipice of being evicted. And even just like the words still life, like it's whose life, you know, whose life matters, it's still a life. So I found that very moving and profound. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jessamine. And, and one thing that, again, thinking about the people who live there and having them co-author, co-lead, and it, it's never even, it's asymmetrical, it's leaning. It's, it, to, I spent, I think, countless hours at that space. Um, and one thing I sh I'm showing here on the slide, uh, platform two. So one thing that was super interesting about the history of it and all the different fragments and branches of what was related to again, which is a very small seven by seven mile city, is that the Mabuhay Gardens Punk Rock Palace was located a couple blocks away, but it was a Filipino owner, Nessa Kino, who owned that 
establishment and the previous Mabuhai was in the first floor of the I Hotel and he was just like activist, um, Jerry Curl, like fancy wearing, suit wearing hustler guy that has this amazing photo online with Red Fox. But he was one of the earliest activists at the same time. And I'm like, how do I get this history? Because I had worked at the San Francisco Art Institute and interviewing various people there on the gardens and of all the different archival stuff I do. And Penelope Houston, who was one of the punk rock musicians who went to SFAI, was telling me everything that went on and even her knowledge of the hotel. So what you see on the left here is this eight inch off the ground with a California compliant um, handicap ramp to wheel up seniors on stage. This is the karaoke stage that the seniors would use, but this is actually what was used for bingo, dancing. Uh, there's some videos on my website that show the bingo. And again, I had to co-run the program. So what you see on the right are uh, Stanford students, um, seniors from upstairs, staff at the building. Uh, Pat Urpina is on the right, who was originally of the, the real hotel, the previous hotel, and he's singing My Way. So there was a flyer of him for the press release of his face and he could come down and we basically said he can sing whenever he wants. Um, and as you know, Jessamyn, because we're both Filipino, if you sing My Way Bad, you can get shot in the Philippines. Like it is a very serious thing. I have happens. to say, Jerome, though, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone sing My Way Good. <laughs> well, then you've missed out on life and we can fix that next time we see uh, Well, I guess it, dep it depends on how you define good, but I've seen, never mind, let's, let's, let's move on. But um, My Way is definitely a quintessential Filipino American song. <laughs> right. And I'm a, and, and like, I'm a horrible singer. People who love me tell me I can't sing, so I don't, but I can pretty much to do everything else in life of uh, like adequately it's true so, i also um, have no here, room i have no room to be criticizing anyone about singing because i cannot carry a tune but go ahead <laughs> right so so here uh what was fun was that the programs like you would shift the exhibition and really you're, you're thinking about architecture um and, and really architecture is about people and how spaces shift how spaces are led and to really uh, run with that as a guide, uh, which was hand in hand with the teaching that was going on. Um, Nick, next slide. So, oh, these comments are awesome. Okay, so uh, platform three, and I know, um, Jessamyn, you had, you've always had a lot of great questions for me regarding pedagogy. Um, that here, I wanted to show, uh, or Jessamyn, did you want to start off? Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about pedagogy. I know it's such an important part of your practice. And, uh, you know, since you're faculty at Stanford, so there's that kind of pedagogy, you're working with college students, but the pedagogy that I'm really more interested in is kind of what you do with the community and like younger people. And I think this is, yeah, platform three is a way to get into that. So would love to hear more. Yeah, so again, and thinking about, um, and even in the intro that Nick had uh, for both of us, that was great. Like, if anything, I just say I work. Like, I teach, I do shows, I have an MFA, but I was trained about to have a PhD. Um, it's In the Bay Area, you, you just work. And I think that here, I like showing these images. On, on the left, you see here the collector slash hoarder of these materials that I was showing you here. I've got boxes of it next to all my other stuff. That is Dan Gonzalez, who at, ni at 19 designed, uh, co-designed the first college of ethnic studies in the country, but really, um, he is really like my second dad, and he's honored in that essay that we talked about at the beginning, but also he collected all of these materials and really thought about the format of uh, the nine unit block at SF State, which was an interdiscipl inter interdisciplinary approach to identifying, investigating, and applying social service theory to uh, the underserved third world communities in San Francisco. So it's short lived, but it's really important because it supported the attainment of a BA and MSW degrees, uh, funded a lot of studies for community needs, but more importantly to this day, contributed the formation of direct service nonprofits in the South of Market, which are a lot of the families and young people that I teach that befriend the Stanford students. And there's a lot of uh, kind of like cross sector alliances, friendships, uh, even relationships across like a place ultra elite and contested at Stanford versus like the stuff on the ground where the SS state nine unit block was really testing like, okay, we're, we're not so much invested at that time in the late sixties, early seventies of getting people into the academy and publishing in journals. Uh, part of my language, they didn't care about that shit. They wanted to get people into neighborhoods at that scale, working with people 
So what you see on the right is Tamiko Robinson, all the way at the far right, who I went to Korea for basically working on this content. Nancy Hom, one of the biggest leaders and former director of Kearney Street Workshop, uh, the oldest um, interdisciplinary Asian American organization located in the first floor of the I Hotel, uh, curator and uh, senior curator of Arizona State University Museum, Julio Morales, who was the curator of this project. A lot of amazing people behind such an infrastructural uh, endeavor across education, across schools. Um, I'll end it this way with um, how big the network was. It was accredited classes at Stanford, uh, San Francisco Art Institute, the SF Unified School District, different elders coming in. So it was this monster of having so much fun, this machine, along with running the exhibition, along with running the program. So I was like juggling all these systems all the same time. Um, and that said, there's a lot of stuff that gets collected, a lot of objects, a lot of amazing documents, a lot of ephemera, a lot of bricks, a lot of ideas that where do you put it, where does this go, uh, which leads to the next slide. So here is platform four and five where uh, Tammy relocated and moved to Seoul, South Korea, where she's professor at Hanyang University. And we talked about how to continue this project. And again, thinking of contact points of who do you know and trust. And this practice that I have, which is so much about collaboration and so much about living with people and, and growing with people over many, many years and how people evolve into ideas that they have, what they get bored of, when they just want to shut up and work on something else, like the real gritty things you can't plan. Again, that there was so much, there's so many rich items that came about this process of finding such a pivot of history for the hotel that really talked about migration, the changing of American life, the building of educational institutions, this emergent of this emerging field of contemporary art and public art that was happening. What you see on these bo both of these images is actually Gwangju, South Korea, which is known for the country's 1980 uprising for democracy. And one of the wildest things I've ever been invited to was to be a researcher with Tammy uh, for the Asia Cultural Center. And I want you to think of the Smithsonian on steroids, 100% state funded. And it takes me 45 minutes to walk around it. And I'm in shape and like it, it's, as, it's bigger than a football stadium. And it's all based on different ideas of archiving, of performing arts, of different ways for culture to engage the public. And there were three USA researchers. Two of them was me and Tammy. The other was Clara Kim, who now is senior curator at the Tate Modern. And it was this beautiful Stanford related history, but also again, the Bay Area history where Clara had uh, worked on getting art exhibitions, ephemera and books and things, Jessamine, you'd be very interested in of uh, different exhibitions and artist books from the 70s to now of Asian American artists, diaspora and collecting that, and that was one collection. And Tammy and I were the other two researchers and we basically brought everything we found, but how that, really that legacy of the hotel and these ideas have extended across Asia. So what you see are political buttons, napkins from restaurants, t-shirts from festivals, but also children's books, calendars, uh, photography that people hid away. I have a saying, a lot of the best objects that you have are never in museums, they're in people's houses getting dusty in boxes. Um, those are the things I'm really invested in. And that really was contact points again of who do we call, who are our friends, who have fought this fight. We found out there were pirated versions of Fall the Eye Hotel in Asia, but to show people that you can still fight for the cities you live in, Taipei, Seoul, and it's still growing and I'm still working on this project. So again, it's really across to the rest of the world. And a lot of these ideas that Jessamyn, you brought up, how do you work with people? You have to really live with them, figuring out like, how are these ideas still relevant? How are they affecting different cities and different ideas of who gets to live where and all these different ideas of diaspora throughout, throughout the world? Uh, next slide. I like showing Jessamine these photos because these are always about pedagogy and younger people and smiling people that could easily be our cousins. I treat Jessamine like a, like a cousin now, if you can't tell. So. I sometimes make him call me Ate, which means like older sister, older cousin in Tagalog. Although I'm like only a year, like maybe not even a year older than Jerome. 
<laughs> no, but that was like, that, that's like when you know the work is working because, and we'll get to it when we go back to the billboard, but that was like the first five minutes. So everyone who's listening. So Jessamine and I had never met. Um, maybe I should say this when we get to the billboard, but I think that here, um, and I'll hold it right because the billboard's like not that far away, but um, what you see here, <laughs> I make Nick Bennett call me Papa. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, we, we can, we can uh, talk about this more later, but what you see here is um, when you're working on something really so historic, though still contemporary, quite like yesterday of the I hotel, but a struggle that's happening in basically the moment after the second dot com boom and the huge disparities of wealth in San Francisco, that this question has been ongoing and so much a part of the identities of people who live in the South of Market area, which is incredibly rich of the uh, Moscone Center, which is the biggest convention center, SF MoMA, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, but also different immigrant communities, but even the leather district and different families and a lot of the different startups that help a lot of my friends who work there. So you're constantly juggling your stance and your position across all these moving factors. So the legacy of the hotel and a lot of those uh, different pockets and movements for the right to learn about ourselves brought me to the South of Market and the South of Market Community Action, Action Network, which is a multiracial community-based organization of all the smiling folks you see on the right. On the left is an exhibition we did at another senior center. And I have to say, senior centers as exhibition spaces are underrated because they have great floors, great lights, the audience is ready, they're a lot of fun. As a veteran of two senior center historical shows, I probably will do a third. Again, if you look at the documentation, that, that's not a gallery, that's a senior center, if you can believe it. Um, so I wanted to work with them because they were having fun really addressing the same concerns back then. And again, like when you're working on this for this long, you need to enjoy it as long as people have here. And that's one of the biggest lessons I learned from people who are in the movement that are much older is that otherwise you burn out very quickly. You have to truly enjoy in different ways how to work on this content, how to have it help you grow intellectually with people internally, self-reflexive within yourself. That's the only way you're gonna make it to five years, 10 years, where I'm at 20 years. I'm really thinking long game like a Grace Lee Boggs where uh, before we go to the next slide, I'm thinking there's gotta be different Grace Lee Boggs in so many different communities in this country, you know? Uh, next slide. So what you see here is one of many exhibitions. Uh, this is not a senior center, but this is City College in San Francisco of a lot of different campaigns and ephemera of the social justice causes and sign making and artifacts that SOMCAN uses of different, I swear to God, it's like, it, it never stops. It's like housing rights, um, rising minimum wage, uh, food rights, free food programs, computer programs, uh, different services for after school children, uh, different types of music and artistic programs. It, it's really a laboratory to try to test these things, but also I become very quickly the fun uncle, the quick cousin of a lot of these people working in this community. So they are really inspiring me, but also keeping a lot of my ideas in check because they're the leaders who are affecting policy that are leading organizational changes and policy changes uh, within the city. And I take this information back to contact points in Korea. So it's constantly zooming in and zooming out um, in this way in a city that is just consistently, consistently interesting because it's changing in such unprecedented rates and with different contacts because migrants are still always coming in, you know? Uh, next slide. Oh, this is my favorite part. Jessamine is a wonderful translator, so much better than me. <laughs> okay, so this this text, it's in Tagalog. It says, Walang sinumang nasa tamang pag-iisip ay dadayo dito kung alam lamang ang tunay na kahulug kahulugan ng lupang ito. And I probably, I don't know if my pronunciation is all that uh, proper. My parents can tell me later. But the translation is, no one in their right mind would come all the way here if only they knew the true meaning of this land. Right, and this is a public art project with Samkan where we projected uh, different texts in Spanish and Tagalog in this like hit and runway all across the South of Market uh, with really provocative um, telling 
complex, complicated, paradoxical, paradoxical, enigmatic statements. Um, my take was that no one would come here, no one in their right mind would come here who knows the real meaning of this land. And this text is from the poetry of the dear Albert Robles. I have the original book, the uh, I Hotel Champion Poet. Jessamine has the new book. Um, my book is signed before he passed away. Um, well, my prized possessions. Okay, okay, and mine's want... not signed. <laughs> we can get his nephew Tony to sign it. Tony's in one of the photos coming up soon. Um, but really looking at this, this, again, these threads of lineage, these ways for people to enter such an irreducible universe scale of a history through quotes that um, the poet is Al Robles. There you go. And what was really fun was that I wasn't done thinking about his text and placing it in the most provocative of areas because the South of Market is known for an area that has a lot of Filipino families struggling to stay and have every right to stay. And one of the tested locales is actually the point of SF MoMA and your Buena Center for the Arts. And the moment where I met Jessamine through Diaspora Online. Next slide. Yeah, let's, okay. So let's talk about the billboard. Uh, just a little bit of background, my, or at least my personal background with this billboard. Um, as, I said, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't see it in person until very recently, but it kind of started haunting me as early as 2017 or so. I think it went up in 2016, right, Jerome? And um, so I actually only first saw it, if you can believe it or not, on Instagram. And um, I was kind of, you know, if you're Imagine seeing this in person, you're like turn a corner and you see it and it's like grand in scale and you stop in your tracks to look at it like the internet equivalent of that is if you're scrolling through inter Instagram, and you have to stop scrolling. And that's kind of what happened to me and I kind of was just like transfixed, mainly because of that first line, which is Tagalog, it means maybe it's cold there. And, you know, I had never seen Tagalog like in the context of contemporary art, like the text or the language itself, I'd never seen it in kind of a public place. I mean, I gathered from the picture that I saw that it was in a public place. And so um, I was really kind of, kind of obsessed with it in a way. And also the other thing that kind of stuck with me is like that phrase, maybe it's cold there. And then also like in, you know, a couple of years later I moved to Maine and yeah, it's really cold here. So I, um, so I get that phrase just kept coming back and coming back. And then, so I knew I wanted to write on it. And so that's what got me in touch with, with Jerome. And so Jerome, I think we're like, man, we're talking a lot, but let's get through this. Give, give us the background on this billboard and you know, what does the word abeyance mean? That's the title of the billboard. And also who are these voices uh, speaking in the text? Sure, and that's, that's a great way to revisit the way you've encountered it and, and really part of the design of how it travels through the world and, and so many people embrace and lock onto it emotionally and how it affects their lives and the fact that we met and for the people listening that it's pretty amazing that we met and now we're friends through really three words. And, and I think that's part of a larger set of the mechanics at work in this public art commission where it's it's three three americans and three bay area natives showing their or sharing their stories of migration uh display, displacement and resilience which again this is a heavily contested site in the city and it's really in dialogue with the martin luther king jr waterfall nearby which opened in the early 90s with this park and when you look at the billboard it's composed of three texts that can be read as a single statement or in fragments and it collapses time and space and looks at these authors in dialogue with various social historical eras, but also the Yerba Buena Garden, Garden Daily Visitors, which on that day in the first slide, you saw Jessamine and I going like that, cheesing in front of the photo. Um, please follow me on Instagram. I'm actually gonna show that as the last photo of all these different photos of people like seeing it through the years. Uh, but it's, it's again, this, this voice and this collective kind of choreography of voices of the Bay Area's like temporal range of time temporal range of events through this textual and visual tapestry that is equally to care, to despair, to endurance, to fear, and, and ultimately to hope. And next slide. This is where the title comes from. Uh, next slide. 
So the top is from my dear friend uh, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Jose Antonio Vargas, and often known as the country's most famous undocumented person. Uh, the person in the middle is Al Robles, who had that light quote that just had been wonderfully translated in Tagalog. And he, again, was one of the champion poets, if not the champion poet of the I Hotel saga. And he's honored a lot now in the South of the Market. And even someone equally honored, if not more, is Victoria Manalo Draves, a double gold medalist winner in the 1948 London Olympics, who grew up in that neighborhood and has a park honored nearby in her name, uh, saying why she couldn't practice because she was a woman of color back then. Uh, next slide. So I am all about ribbon cuttings. And what I love is that here, it's, it's like a bibliography, a lot of my work. So Dan Gonzalez, the hoarder of many amazing artifacts for contact points and a lot of my life's work. And he's all the way at the end there, um, looking spiffy in his leather outfit. Next to him is Estelle Hobal. And this was the opening ceremony for the billboard. Uh, that's Tony Robles, the nephew of Al Robles. And then the five people on the left to the right are all affiliated with the South of Market or SOMCAN. So that's Ray, who's the uh, chief organizer at SOMCAN uh, with the hoodie, um, or not, sorry, not the hoodie, uh, the cap on, um, the four youngest on the uh, left, everyone is young in this photo, uh, but the four youngest youngest are um, people and teenagers I've worked with who are now young adults. Uh, Maverick, who's a up and coming MC, he's the most overdressed because that was, his, that was his prom night that night, so I surprised him. I just told him to dress up. Always pays to overdress, but equally, if you want to be comfy and cozy wear, that is Alexa Drapiza, who's like my little cousin. Uh, she was yelling at me because she was just dressed in Disneyland wear, but again, everyone looks great in this photo. Uh, I like showing this because these are really the people that I work with, and they're all honored in the book chapter, but they equally have a say in the building infrastructure of how these ideas of San Francisco, of the city, of the neighborhood, uh, these different studies on migration, contemporary public art, they've all had a different say in a lot of the work that I do. They're equally cited, I will probably say in collaboration, uh, depending on what catalogs you find, or if there's some press release, or my interview in Art 21, uh, which will come up a couple slides from now, um, this photo is also in there. So there's, I'm constantly nearby all of these people who are themselves poets, teachers, educators, builders, if anything. And I think what's allowed me to grow consistently through all these years is I'm around people who build and really test themselves and test the different locales that I work in, like what can build and what can sustain when you're thinking about ideas of, again, migration, traveling, but staying, being in one spot, choosing to call a place home. Uh, next slide. So one video online, which is an amazing conversation, uh, right before Jessamyn reads this wonderful uh, part of the book by Jose Antonio Vargas, uh, his book, I highly recommend it, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen. It's an incredibly fast, fulfilling read because, again, he's a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, just a great technical writer, uh, great speed, great control. Um, formally and as a human being, you get to see Jose grow up and we talked about this book uh, in depth and really went at each other like cousins in a way a lot of laughing a lot of uh, a lot of theory a lot of hope a lot of turmoil uh, that we both went through as people and we're about the same age uh, like me and Jessamine um, but one thing we did was we read from the book and I think it was fitting here and Jessamine was so game um, we read page 140 Jose and I on stage but Jessamine can read it now because uh, there's a part that really sticks with Jessamine too yeah, so as I mentioned, I mean, as, as Jerome said, the three words that brought us together were baka malamig doon, maybe it's cold there. And that first line, that's actually um, not Jose's words, but his mother's, when his mother sent him off to the United States from the Philippines, not knowing, uh, by himself, by the way, not knowing that um, he was actually undocumented. And so baka malamig doon were among the few words she said, that those were her last words to him as, as he left the Philippines. And um, something that kind of um, that stays with me are just like I've analyzed those three words like to no end. And, you know, I have to thank my mom for this because she's helped me. You know, baka means maybe. And so that's like inherently ambiguous. Malamig is it means it's cold, but um, there are different ways of saying it's cold. Uh, maginao, if you speak Tagalog, means it's cold as in the weather. 
Malamig could mean cold in lots of other ways, like cold, cold people, people who are not nice, that kind of thing. And do'on, meaning there. And to me, there is, you know, you could say that about anywhere. If you're from the Philippines and if, if, it's, if it's Jose's mom sending him to the United States, she's talking about do'on, meaning California, where he's ultimately going to wind up. But I think uh, as site responsive as that billboard is, uh, I also think that it has the capacity to speak like across sites you know, um, across uh, the, the diasporas, honestly. I mean, what is it some Filipinos are across like 100 countries. Uh, they say, you know, the greatest export of the Philippines is its people. And so Daon could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. And if, if it's cold, it's, it's anywhere colder than the tropics, anywhere colder than the Philippines. It's definitely Maine. And um, so the word Daon, the word there, the difference between here and there and what that actually means is something that, um, has, has stayed with me and something I've been really thinking about. So I'd like to read uh, a quick excerpt out of uh, Jose's book. Uh, this is it, quote, there are an estimated 258 million migrants around the world. And many of us are migrating to countries that previously colonized and imperialized us. Yes, we are here because we believe in the promise of the American dream, the search for a better life, the challenge of dreaming big, but we are also here because you were there. The cost of American imperialism and globalization, the impact of economic policies and political decisions. And so the differences between here and there, it's, it's switched. It's like now we're here and there is where we once were. And so it's, it's really a relative thing. It depends on where you are. And so I thought those were really powerful words by Jose. Next slide. So here, depicting the ocean, a bench shows the edge of San Francisco. The photo is actually from my uh, now defunct iPhone 6, the background photo. So th this is literally Ocean Beach, uh, the edge of San Francisco, but also the edge of the United States. And for some people, the edge of the world, shifting by the second. So it reads, Bakamalamegdun were among the few words she said. As the fog squeezed in, wailing sounds echoed. That's Al Robles. I prayed a lot. I was afraid of the water by Vicki Draves. And these words of mother's love in the mother tongue of activist and athlete appear almost immaculately, immaculately in a space carved out that hovers between the ocean and sky, above our heads and below our feet, whispering to us the words she said that we can't quite remember alone. And that's from the art historian uh, Yinshi Lerman Tan. And here it allowed me to be invited for, uh, next slide, another version of abeyance which was a recent production and public art project for the 2020 Yokohama Triennale. Uh, but this time, as Jessamine said, anywhere in the world, uh, this, place, this took place in Hong Kong. And I have a practice much like my mentor and uh, former um, director at Stanford, um, Jeff Chang, and his recent book, We Gonna Be All Right, which I put in the subtext of the title here. And you're, you're gonna see an expert, or excerpt from a production I made, which is a rotating set of banners that unfurl off the side of a building in downtown HK as part of the episode series of uh, the Triennale, uh, Deliberation for Discursive Justice. So it features text and altered imagery, but it's placed in an alternate port city. And this is the main route of a lot of the organi organizing you see. This is Hennessy Road. Um, and what you're going to see is just the start of a longer uh, video, which I encourage you to see online. But um, Nick, take it away.
One note, Jerome, um, those words are your own, right? In, in abeyance in San Francisco, those are all words from uh, other people, but in, at the Yokohama project, those are your words. Yeah, all the different banners for Yokohama are all my own writing. So it's this, um, the gentle switching of different slogans at the top of the horizon, really for the entire city. So it was just an amazing project. And the two actors in the movie, uh, Michelle Wong and Osgay Erzoy, um, they're really good friends too. So it was incredibly fitting. And it's such a crazy year last year to have really my closest friends in Hong Kong be in the production themselves. So um, I encourage all of you, please watch the whole video on your own time after. Uh, but here, I know that uh, Jessamine, you've always asked, you always asked me uh, what I'm working on now so we can close up um, this fun talk with uh, other stuff that I've been working on. Yeah, let's see the drawings. <laughs> All right, so the title of this, um, The Horizon Towards We Move, uh, The Horizon Towards Which We Move Always Received Before Us is actually the line to the last paragraph in Jeff's book, uh, We Gonna Be All Right. And this process here uh, takes different documents and architectural methods and research to look at different student organizing sites that I've encountered over many, many years. So this is an ongoing series that I've shown uh, several times already. And also it's, it's been written about of, um, in a conversation I have with my good friend, uh, PJ Posacarpio, who's also a pseudo cousin. He actually went to college with my cousins at Santa Cruz. Um, I, I like to say to PJ, he's like uh, the Filipino American version of Kimberly Drew online. And then they're good friends too. So it's like, but PJ's always like posting stuff and all that. Um, PJ might even be here. Uh, but there's, there's this process of different student squares I was finding really looking at the long 60s and what I like to think of as maybe the wide 60s and, and different formations and organizing and these different centers where what you see here is uh, there's no people. There's this vacancy for viewers to enter and this atmosphere quality a portal and this welcoming and this absence so from the top uh, left it, what you see here in this grid of many more that i've made is sf state malcolm x plaza um yonsei university seoul south korea bottom right is uh, chinese university hong kong and then the uh, bottom left is uh, white plaza at stanford where i work and, and there's a lot of these um next slide and last slide And this is SF State, where I walked through that campus. Uh, my arts high school was there, and I walked through this place a couple times a week. It's kind of the equivalent of uh, LaGuardia Arts High School in New York or uh, different art schools in the United States. Um, and here, I had so much time in the same way with your Buena, but here I'm really looking at ways to kind of connect these different movements outside of the biggest cities you hear about 1968 mexico city paris this um this way of looking at different forms of mobilizing in public space mobilizing with people in really an endless set of locations across the world i have like hyderabad india i have like uh different parts of the uc system i've been able to collect these sites through recommendations from friends so it's extremely organic to where ultimately it's through people in the same way like contact points, I'm amassing all these sites. I'm not hitting the big famous ones first. If anything, I stay away from that. I'm asking like, what do you recommend I study and look at? And one person's like, oh, like UC Santa Barbara had this going on. Or, oh, UC San Diego, there was this building where stuff went down maybe 10 years ago. Or maybe here where at Stanford where I work, I had activists actually tell me, no, it was White Plaza over here in this corner. And it's also a fun excuse and way to keep my friendships with people and asking them, hey, what happened here? So also, this is how I stay in touch and I'm constantly building with my friends while at the same time making these rich architectural drawings and the studio work, this gallery, uh, museum-based work, which behind it so much more are the rich friendships that make my life worth it in doing this work for 20 years and hopefully many, many more, and now which includes you, Jessamine. So um, that said, uh, there's also links in the chat that have like Jessamine and my Instagram and how we met. So you can meet us there too. I wanted to say that. Um, and all this work is on my site and there's always posts that I make about upcoming stuff and, and whatnot. But um, again, it's really about the ways your work brings new people into your lives. And I'm just so lucky that 
it was like how Justin and we met and the BR family and all of that. So again, um, thanks so much, Justin. How do you how do you want to end this part before we go into fun Q and A? Um, I don't know. There's some good questions in the Q and A already, I think. And I mean, I think we can keep the conversation going there. So Nick, if you could stop sharing the slides. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll throw out some weird ones about Jolly B, I guess. But I think we have questions in the Q and A. Um, 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 uh, echo. Um, I want to thank you both, Jerome and Desmond, so much um, for today's really open and generous conversation. We do have quite a few lined up, so we can kind of we can take those. And Jessamine, at any point, if you do want to present a question, please feel free. Um, first, I am going to hand the mic over to. Jennifer Nelson. Jennifer, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Great. And hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. All right. Um, yeah, I guess my question was, I'll just read it if that's okay. I know not everyone finds it easy to read the chat. So, um, and I guess in general, the first part is directed to Jerome. So what do you see as the role of beauty in your work? Because so much of what we've been seeing and discussing or what y'all have been discussing, um, you know, like the billboards, the banners, the videos. And I, my question came up when I was watching that video and the incredible sort of light shining through as the fabric was being manipulated. You know, there's so much rhetoric of beauty in this. And I think that's unusual in a lot of work that I've been seeing lately. And I guess I was just curious, what do you see the place of that as being in your work? And then I guess to Jessamine, you know, as a curator, I mean, both of you could answer both parts of this question, but how do you see beauty working in the art of Filipino diaspora in general? Do you think that's something, there's something there or, um, and maybe as I see someone named Starkman suggesting, um, and I'll just quickly show my face for a second. This is what I look like. Um, <laughs> is it beauty even the right word? Do I mean like poesis? Do I mean sort of rhetorics of technique? Do I mean the facture? What am I really talking about? I meant beauty, but if you find something else more interesting to talk about in connection with my question, just go for it. I'm just curious. Okay, okay for... uh, Jennifer, we should, um... oh, just a minute, go ahead. You first, you're older. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, Jennifer, thank you for your question. I should say Jennifer is actually a new friend of mine too. Um, we started the um, Philippine Diaspora's Art Collective together along with a couple of other people in the audience today, uh, Pearly Rose Baluyut, and uh, I think Lane is here, Lane Bangilan Little, and I don't know if Tiffany's here, I think she had to leave early, but thanks Jennifer for your question. Uh, the first part is directed to you, Jerome, so I'll have, I'll ask you to answer it with regard to your work while I think about how it relates to the larger issue of Philippine art in the diaspora. <laughs> well, the funny part, I was thinking of the second answer because like I, I think about this stuff every day, which I probably shouldn't for my own health. Um, okay, it's funny because I think I feel like I can come up with an answer when it comes to your work, but in terms of the larger, I don't, maybe it should be. Fun. Okay, okay. Let, how about, how about I try the first one and then we'll go to the second one. Um, okay. I'm just laughing because on my screen, it's just like you, me, and Nick. I bet you Nick has the best answer of like <laughs> the Philippine diaspora, like what's the state of it? Like Nick, like Nick will guide uh. us to the golden light. Um, okay, so the first, Jennifer, to your, to your question. Um, so I'll, I'll say it this way in terms of Philippine American artists, and it is an incredible time right now where people are looking for each other. Um, art historians uh, to where I say that I think we're, that field is last in a lot of ways where you see the lineage of literature, or even cinema studies is so much stronger and longer. And you look at kind of the, or what I've seen and what I've been raised by, like there's such a rich sisterhood in academia of amazing scholars and writers, also who are artists and filmmakers. And, and I think for me, I came up in that, I, I like to say I come up from different lineages and I was fortunate to get, to get the green light to put the alchemy together where I can say equally, I was an SF state lineage, but I was also trained as a formalist to be an architect, but also uh, the San Francisco Art Institute opens in 2005 and I get the old guard. I, I was one of the lucky few young people to work with Carlos Villa before he passed away in the World in Collision series. 
Um, and his golden generation of the 90s that were uh, way closer and are getting a lot of the limelight as they should uh, with his retrospective work after he passed away. I'm part of that lineage. But also SFAI, Okween Weezer and Hu Han Ru, who are mentioned in the book chapter, they become my bosses and I was the protected kid where I got to learn and I'm from that lineage too. And then I get Stanford money. So it's like putting all these resources together that historically have never been put together it brings a lot of possibility to where like, okay, you can have all this rich history. This shit still got to look good. It's got to be, it's got to be moving. It's got to be amazing. The light as you saw um, that beautiful Saturday morning in Hong Kong, but also the way everything is crafted and, and the really unfair metrics you have as the artists of color in the United States where being in Korea it actually feels like me truly more the rest of the world where I don't got to deal with that. Like I get, I get to take a break from being an American as kind of messed up as that sounds, but it's very true. I feel the weight coming off my shoulders where I can focus on work and different qualities formally, but also different historic measures of how I want my work to operate in the world. So I come back refreshed. I come back to Stanford. Back then, Jeff Chang was my boss working there. We were really testing these ideas. So I'm able to have work that looks the way it does, that resonates the way it does, that allows audiences to own it as their own. Um, I do work with text a lot as Jessamine like read those words with her own heart and, and with a way that we're in relation to bodies of water so deeply that you can put that billboard pretty much anywhere near a body of water, it will resonate as long as people can read certain parts of the language. Again, it, it's three people title, but actually it's four people and it starts with a mother talking to a child. That's part of the work. It's next to the Martin Luther King Jr. waterfall. So when you're looking at it, and if you go to Jessamine's Instagram, which I recommend you all follow, you can see it waving in the air. Jessamine's like getting embarrassed. I'll, I'll do that as your uh, younger cousin. Um, and, but then you're hearing the roar of the Martin Luther King waterfall, and that is completely thought out too. And there's these subtle hints that are all thought out that is the standard I hold myself to. That's the level of beauty that or the level of sensoria or the way audiences can like endlessly enter and stay with the work in the way Jessamine was relentlessly thinking about this work for a year before even knowing who the hell I was, it didn't matter. The work worked because it stayed with Jessamine this entire time. But that's yes. also what we bring. That's also what we bring to this world. And that's the standard I have for work that talked about the Filipino diaspora in this way, because leading to my second part, then I'll throw it to Jessamine. I talked about this with Jose on stage and even in the car rides where we'll go home, they'll drop me off. And I'm like, that billboard moves people because it's depressing as shit, but it's really who we are. Yet, I'm super hopeful in pretty much all throughout my work of like, okay, you can endure the bottom, you win double gold. You can endure this in a hotel. At the top, I told this to Jose, I think you're eventually going to win and you'll get citizenship. I don't know how, but we're going through that live. The top one is like what's happening now, right, right now live in that billboard, the Yerba Buena one, which is really in some ways 28 words, only 28 words, but really a summary of a century of our existence in this country. As one of many lenses to look at it that way. So that's my take on the larger field of, let's say, contemporary art of the Filipino or Filipino American diaspora, which has so many key people jumping in. I'm thinking of the school of like Patrick Flores in the Philippines where like that crew and that younger crew, those are like my cousins now. Um, what Jessamine's forming with you, Jennifer, uh, this legacy of people working in California. The work and the quality and the excellence and where we went to school, that's all there. Now it's like ferociously, everyone's trying to find each other as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think like the time is right. I mean, I think we're all just about like second generation Filipino Americans now. So it's like, of course it's happening now because we've been here long enough for it to happen, for all of us to kind of, you know, grow up and come into our own. And as far as beauty is concerned, I, I wasn't, you know, I guess I was thinking about beauty in some ways, you know, especially when I was looking at Jerome's work, but like the word that really comes to mind is affective. Like, I think it's affective, whether you look at it in person or whether you're looking at it through a screen. Uh, and that, that was the power of it for me. And I think uh, a lot of, um, successful work is affective. I mean, it has to hit you in some way. It has to make you stop. It has to make you think, make you appreciate, make you want to know something more or feel something more, or like you're just stopped in your feeling. And I think that's, that's great. So um, yeah, beauty, I feel like is, is a loaded word, but um, <laughs> so uh, I, I would prefer to say affective about it. Mm. 
Wait, I just said thank you. <laughs> Sorry, okay. thank you for letting me unmute. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm next going to hand the mic over to, I apologize, I'm sure you have a name, but um, your username is Starkman. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Thank yeah. you. Um, also want to say I'm second generation Filipino. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, which was my question. Um, the, react, the response to uh, the Hong Kong project and also your plans for the drawings that uh, you're collecting of the plazas. Thank you. It's a very direct question compared to the last one of the <laughs> weight of like the entire, <laughs> what is the future of uh, this field? Um, so the, the reception to the Hong Kong project was very fleeting and, and, and light and very, very receptive. There were a lot of people that morning. There, there's background images of people because it's, um, and, and again, to, to shift away from the Filipino part that we were talking about, or Filipino IOX, whatever uh, suffix you want to use now, there's, what was nice about this context was it was, it couldn't be as any more different from the Yerba Buena one in that for Yokohama, which is not in Hong Kong, the commission was to have it start the tree and all before COVID hit. So it was supposed to be in March of 2020 to where there would be the platform was actually where they would drop the banners at the same time of the platform, which was an after party done by a uh, Johannesburg DJ who flew in. And I was like, sign me up. I am all about this project. Uh, and I have a lot of pride because there's there are only two USA representatives. There's me and Nick Cave. And Nick Cave's famous. And I'm like, this is it's just me. But I'm just like, oh, wow, this is like such an amazing moment to instill swiftly Jeff's book. And then these texts, which are very referential, pointing back to the YBCA billboard, which um, the director's Rex Media Collective, they saw that as luminous and like, okay, we want a version of that. Like the reception and the buildup was what could that look on the horizon of a city that had such a contested, still to this day of that place, but with a lot of hope, as I said in the previous question and, and in the conversation. So COVID happens, the world's on fire, world of many fires. Um, and instead of me flying there for the after party, they did a Zoom dance party However, they had all this money left over and they're like, Jerome, what would you like to do? I'm like, I want to make a movie. Let's still do the project all the way. And they said, yes. So that actually was the last project to where I joke, it's the Avenger scene, the shawarma scene where everyone's eating. That actually ended the tree and all, which if you look at the premise that Rax put, it's a very hopeful tree and all. So that is the larger answer to what was the reception on the ground in the moment of wonder and wonderment they saw, but also the cap and the fitting, the end of a chapter of such a hopeful, seamless, really positive exhibition from all the reviews and experience of what, experiences of what I saw. Uh, such a gift for me to experience with global friends and a lot of my key friends there. So that was that. The second part with the drawings, um, PJ Policicarpio uh, curated this amazing show, uh, Solidarity Struggle Victory, where it was part of that show. There was a uh, another show at the Cantor Museum at Stanford showing a different version of an SF State drawing. I have many of these that uh, we're figuring where it will show next. And it's also part of a publication project I'm doing with my dear collaborator and co-teacher of public art at Stanford, um, Ala Eftekar, who's represented by the third line in Dubai. And we're doing a publication. Um, uh, I'm doing a publication with Ala and we're figuring out what is going to be the right format for that. I can keep you posted. Let's exchange info. Um, but that project is, has the longest interview of Dan Gonzalez of his entire life in there in conjunction with uh, no less than probably 10 to 20 drawings of different sites. So it's really looking at the legacy of the long 60s and what I like to think of as more a wider 60s and a more obscure 60s. So it's not just a future uh, solo exhibition, but it's a future publication, which really uses a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about today. And really a lot of the ideas Jessamine has wonderfully talked about as well. Thank you so much. I'm a curator in Houston and yeah, let's um, try to do something in Houston. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. It's a productive day. Um, next, I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague, Malvika. Malvika, you can turn on your mic. Thank you, Nick. Um, Jerome and Jasmine, I've really loved listening to the two of you speak. Uh, the space of your 
really collaboration and friendship is just so rigorous and wonderful and playful. Um, so it's really been a treat. Uh, what I loved while you were talking about the I Hotel and that sort of set of images and work, um, what I loved so much is sort of how you position that hotel as a container for a set of social relations um, or like community coalescing or political organizing and kind of thinking about how a space like an architectural space can be more than just the hotel, but a space for imagining kind of alternative models of living. Um, I really loved that and like what you were doing with the butterfly knife and the extrapolation. Um, so my question is kind of one of practice. Uh, you know, you, I'm reading these as kind of like research based, historically based, archival based, almost like language based projects, um, which is a little bit different from just a straight visual practice. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think or frame your own practice in your mind. Um, like, for instance, the butterfly knife and the cantaloupe. Um, I saw that as like very historical, almost like forensic. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of like your own logics that you've cooked up for yourself or like how is it that you work and how are you thinking about these works? Um, wow. I love that this is recorded. That is, I, I need to use that. That was such a great way to set it up and frame. I was like, wow, you just got so many different parts of what I've had to live through and, and figure out in the last 20 years. And I think that um, it, it's really, I think as I've gotten older yet, I think I'd like to think we are all young, that the different rigors of moments and schools of thought that I've had, which is like you think about UC Berkeley and SF State and what they're known for um, as public institutions, uh, my family at the Stanford Art and Art History Department, but also Ida, where I work, where, where I do want to say, because State and Cal have gotten a lot of play in this talk and looking back at 50 years, the equivalent at Stanford is actually Ida, CB, CBPA, of uh, black performing arts where they've been around about 50 years and that's where I work. So like by fate, I've arrived at all these places having to think about legacy and time every day, like just casually, like it's part of my body, it's part of my DNA. So I, I look at it in terms of the work, the studio work that I do, um, very kind of like PhD student wise of like where, where's the new scholarship that needs to be done so I know how it's adding or where it's adding to. Don't get me wrong, I like playing and getting messy and doing fun stuff, but I, I think because the explosion of the world opening that I got to experience to where I'm very lucky education-wise and I got to see international work, work from the San Diego Tijuana border of like the insight legacy there, like work after Oakley's Documenta 11, I was his assistant for 12 in the Grand Tour in 2007, uh, seeing work come out from the Philippines and from Manila, the artist run spaces and the new young curators who are a little younger than me, but we were in the curatorial programs in Gwangju, South Korea at the Gwangju Biennial Curator course. And it's kind of like one of every country. Think summer camp with K-pop, with like the UN and everyone's like, it's batshit hot. It's like 90 degrees. You all have each other. You're partying at night. Amazing time of your life. Like that's, that is really composing a lot of the practice that I do because those are the influences that I'm getting and different practices where um, I, I think that the work that I do and why the standards of what looks, I hate to use the word beautiful, but like what is really affective, uh, really moving uh, the different types of research outside of the West, the different research on the ground within the West, I'm holding myself to all these insane standards that it ends up the way it does and why the work often for me takes many, many years. Don't get me wrong, I'm going as fast as I can, but I'm honestly going as fast as I can. And like with friendships, you can't rush three, four years. You can't rush five, six, seven years. That's the way it comes out the way it does. Cause in the video you saw, which is moving to pretty much everyone who watches it, that's the first melon cutting take of no less than a hundred melons I've cut. I actually don't eat cantaloupe anymore cause I've, I've been OD'd after going through that process, but it, it comes through all that rigor and it arrives as something so simple as that, but that is everything I've lived through in these moments, whether it's a square billboard that Jessamine sees, sees the three words, we're now friends, a video of that, the high line of a contested country in Hong Kong, that is endless, relentless work coming through in that way. That's the studio practice. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for that question, Malvika. Um, I mean, I know it was directed at Jerome, but I have a couple of ideas I wanted to kind of share or throw out there. Um, to go back to the affective versus beauty question, you know, great question, Jennifer. But um, something that I meant to bring up earlier is that Jerome also likes to talk about his work in terms of both grace and rage at the same time, and also joy and urgency at the same time. So. I think now everyone's kind of heard of the social and historical context and like everything that people have have gone through. Um, but maybe the beauty that you're seeing or the affective quality of the work that you're feeling is actually speaking to the grace side of the equation or the joy side of the equation that Jerome is talking about. And as he said, you know, shit has to look good. So it's there. Um, as far as your other question about like architecture and like how these spaces or, or places um, can mean so much or can be more than just places for you to inhabit or to, to exist in. The other thing that I think about in terms of Jerome's work is in contact points and the stuff he does with Samkin and also the butterfly knife. It's like the sheer materiality of it also, like the ephemeral quality of some of those things as well. And just the thingness of it or the stuffness of it, you know? Um, I think that about that a lot too, and also what materiality actually means to the Philippine diaspora. And so something that it reminds me of, or something that I think about is um, the, the, this thing, it's called a Balik Bayan box. And it's a box that like a lot of uh, Filipino families, it's like, I forget the dimensions. It's like a standard dimension, like how much, like what is the maximum dimension that you can ship or that you can you know, send on a plane? And so, for example, Filipino Americans or Filipino Canadians or wherever we may be, we just load these boxes with things. It could be any like commercial goods, like it could be like uh, canned food, it could be like M and M's, it could be shoes or clothes, and then this stuff just goes back um, to the Philippines, to people we've uh, left behind, to family we've left behind, and so. Materiality, I think, takes on uh, another kind of context as not just being a thing, but a thing that, you know, that travels, that travels like across the world because we've been dispersed. And so I'm not sure, Jerome, if, if like, I'm not sure if you're necessarily thinking of the Balik Bayan box when you're think, working with things, but that's something that I, that came up for me. I, I think to round out that response in, in the way that and again, I think um, when you're looking at, and I said different legacies or lineages that I work in, but also it's, I would say different families. And I grew up here with, I think 27 cousins. My dad had 10 brothers and sisters. They all had kids. Um, one had a different job. You could think of whether it was like nurse, fire chief, doctor, male person, teacher, uh, office worker. So I was seeing the dynamics that would happen to my cousins. And as you know, like your cousins are your best friends growing up in my neighborhood, which is like mostly brown and black. And it was loud, rowdy, messy. People were like playing sports, talking shit. It was beautiful. It was like old San Francisco. And I think those dynamics of how people really live, work, and eventually build with each other, because their parents were these activists. Um, Dan Gonzalez actually lived down the road, like not too far. Um, and, and I think that for me, the counter to objects is a lot of like memory and things that are fleeting, things that you stay and that are important to you. The billboard itself is word, it's 28 words, and it looks like the thing's gonna fly away. The sand and the water that go over it and that how things are very quickly erased in a moment's notice i think that for me that is so much of the existence of americans too and what i take on myself personally is the audiences that have for this work because it, i mean a hong kong audience for the tree is a very different audience than ybca here and ultra local in a neighborhood but to have it emotionally read as forceful and as heavy and as rich and as complicated with joy, the rage of like having to fight uphill your entire life. These, these contexts that don't get any easier and how strenuous and exhausting it is to do this type of work. Like the joy part is really like, okay, how do people endure? I'm hitting on 20 years. I know people who are clocking in 50, 60, even 70, but they're having the time of their lives. They're having a lot of fun. So I'm constantly learning and seeing how they do it because that's the only way you're able to do this work. I mean, this is a lovely bar conversation where anyone that in the academy or artists, like one of the biggest things I tell people that is one of the biggest bonding things about the art world is to talk shit about it or the academy or like where you work, but it's actually not about the place. That's actually how you're bonding with people. 
And it's like, oh, wait, they're going through the same thing I am. That's actually what I had in Korea. So, like, in different countries, people are figuring out how do we make our work? How do we take care of our, like, our, the places where we live? How do I keep our org from not breaking down? That has been so much growth in seeing how different systems completely outside of where I live here and in this country are dealing with it all across Asia with different locales and different governments. For me, that's the frontier that I love working in now, and it's probably going to be the future of my own work. And probably dragging you and Jessamine too. I'm like, hey, hey, Jessamine. <laughs> that's the fun that I get to have. I love that. Um, talking shit is bonding. Uh, I think we have time for just two more questions. So I'm going to next pass the mic over to Josh. Josh, you should be able to turn on your mic. Jerome, Jessamine, what's up? What's good? Anum Bolita. Yo, um, my question was, you know, uh, I was doing a little bit of research. I was looking at some of the links you were provided. I was wondering what exactly... What do you want to do now, Jerome? If you had, if you had about, you know, the organization and everybody had 300 bodies, what you want to do with the um, International Hotel? Or, you know, is it, is it along the lines of, um, you know, creating something similar for the Filipino community, you know, inside of San Francisco? So I'm not sure, like, if, if, if I kind of like, you know, missed anything, but, I was just wanting to know if you if you had the, the the strength or the ability to do anything you could do right now in order to get your job done, your goal, you know, uh, like your legacy and all that, confront your destiny and everything. What do you need? What do you want? Go ahead, just just, just Yo, say I, it, Jerome. I, it don't matter what it is. Just whatever you need. Oh no, it's, it's, it, was, it, was, it was cooking. I, I was about to thank you. It was like you were giving it. I was like, okay, like uh, like we got to bring you to uh, we got to bring you to the meeting too. So so there's um yeah uh, just follow me. I'll follow you back. Uh, so I got two answers quickly because I just I don't want to overthink it. You should never overthink these questions. I'm already doing that shit. Like the what i didn't mention about south of market is like they are building a um there's a another org with a lot of friends in it called soma filipinas which is a cultural district being formed look that up they got some great folks there uh and south of market community action network which is a different org but angelica was actually part of the original legislation in the city what i've shown you today is a lot of front end like tree and all i've also been in the prospect biennial uh do, looking for the first filipino civilization right outside of new orleans i have a movie on that with uh, my dear collaborator william cordova we do a lot of stuff uh behind the scenes um which you may be interested in i do a lot of black panther research and a lot of materials that i have of the original newspapers that william has that i've, I've collected and i put together um but i think the back end, something I do want to say, and Joshua, thank you for the great question. Um, what I didn't say in this entire talk, I do heavy infrastructure work behind the scenes. I write a lot of grants. I, I write a lot of grants for orgs that have my name not on it, and I tell them, don't put my name on that shit. But like, I really think of how to build structure uh, in terms of like, let's be real, five, six, seven figure budgets looking in that way of how to get it to the people that really, really need it. Um, I will always be doing that work because at the end of the day in the South of Market, like, it's not about me. It's about the family. There's so much stuff I've had my hand in and writing the language. Like, I don't need that. I don't need that. I work at Stanford. I got, like, my contemporary art world stuff. I've had to live with different people throughout these 20 years. So that's that because at the end of the day, um, even though I'm decked out in, like, free Stanford gear that all, like, my amazing black and brown students at Stanford hooked me up with because I love free stuff, um, I don't rep I don't rep institutions, I rep communities. And I think that the bigger goal is through that. Like I don't need much. My parents came here with less than two hundred bucks. Like I know how to live with nothing, but also I know how to live being funded by Samsung and Korean government money, making amazing research projects. Like, but that's what we are in the academy in the contemporary art world. We move through all these different spaces that may be extremely uncomfortable for our parents and other members of our family. But that is the responsibility we have. This shit is supposed to be hard. And I think that what, um, with your question of what do I want, I want more people to enter, to have it better than me, to have it easier, 
That's what good parents do. That's what good families do. Nothing makes me happier than seeing a younger person get more opportunities, having more people being able to talk about the work, having more spaces for them. I don't need much. If they get it, like there's probably a lot of projects you've seen that I've helped write the grant I've advised. You will never know. I don't need people to know. Like I'm, I'm at peace with that stuff. And I think for me is being able to help, even on Jessamyn stuff with this organization of art historians, we need a Filipino American in our history book, but also I've worked on Latinx projects. I work at Ida, which is heavily black and black diaspora, uh, teaching filmmakers, um, advising on their projects, and they're gonna go way farther I could have, than I could ever dream of. I'm all about equity in the biggest sense because I am pro-black, pro-indigenous, pro-you name it. Even if Filipino Americans can't get their shit together, my heart is big enough, I can get it to everyone else. I have that amount of patience. I have that amount of range in what I do. So that's the answer to your question. Like, it's about what this country should look like. It's what the rest of the world needs to look like. I am all about like long game, ultra short game in the meeting. Like again, as I said, there's a Grace Lee Boggs or someone equivalent in so many different communities. My goal is to find those people and to, and to work in that way and to keep it before it gets like highly sterile, it becomes performative. That's why like the stuff you've seen are just flashes, but like behind the scenes, I think as it always has been, that's really the history of this country. That's really the history of organizing in the world. That's why my projects look the way they do. So if I had, if I had all the people, or if I had more people, because I do have a lot of people, Joshua, to wrap this, this response up, and let's connect, because like, I love this question. Um, I've been doing that work. It would be a louder version of that same work. See you wow. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Josh. And thank you, Jerome, for that amazing answer. For the, in the interest of time, I think we're going to go over to our final question. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to the world's very own Fong H. Bui. Fong, you can take the floor. Thank you, Nick. Jerome! Fong! Jessamyn! Hooray! Hey, Fong! Hooray! <laughs> hey, you guys. That was terrific. Terrific. I mean, as you know, most of us are obsessed about soccer at the moment, you know. So the <laughs> other night I watched, yeah, I mean, I watched twice, even till four in the morning, you know, the, 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 the Italy against Austria. And when the second goal Matteo Passina made and defeated Austrian team, I couldn't help but thinking about the Democratic Party, you know. It's like a soccer team whose entire team is chasing after the ball, you know, with no strategy whatsoever. But it's just rem reminded, I don't know who's, who will say it, the relatively famous aphorism that say, self-discipline is doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done, even when you don't feel like doing it, you know? So my, 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 my thinking also about this is that we are tired of being pigeonholed. You know, the idea of Asian separate within many tiny niches of Asian community. And the fact that I just, during this pandemic, I began thinking about it. How, for example, take Stanford University. I only been there twice because I visit a few friends who gone to school there for their doctoral, you know, just like you have. And I pay a visit to Hoover uh, Institute. And during this pandemic, I, I have gone back to listen almost every episode that Peter Robinson have hosted. I don't know, you're probably familiar with the program called Uncommon Knowledge. It's so incredibly important to understand what, how it was built in terms of that massive archive began with the first war, the second war. You guys probably remember Peter Robinson. He was very famous for having been the uh, speech writer for George W. Bush and Reagan before him. Uh, and he hosted everybody who's, who appear on it, whether Drew Files, Drew Giffen Files, whether Doris Kearns Goodwin, Thomas Sowell, uh, I don't know, Christopher Hitchin, William Buckley Jr. You, it's just so interesting to understand the that history and how it relates to Stanford University too, and what you mentioned earlier about the late 60, Jerome, how it emerged. Uh, 
uh, to the very, very peak of all of that studies. My point is, how can we bring our community together? Exactly the, the only hope that we must do. We can't just afford to be separate, you know, playing for our own uh, so-called following ambition wherever and not able to connect. For example, recently we have experienced anti, you know, Asian hate, for example, and there have been talk, you know, there's few younger generation reach out to us about creating a show in New York City. Uh, but I just realized we don't have enough network of friends to do it. I think it should be uh, across the country really, you know? Uh, so we have to really put our brain together. So thanks for the talk because it gave me so much energy and idea how we can bring together now, you know? Uh, and that's the idea. We gotta really work together. So we can't just be easily pigeonholed and label. The rail is not an institution. I suffer so much for people who are trying to label the rail as an institution. We're not an institution. I'm not interested in working for the institution. I collaborate with the institution before. That's how I met Jessamine, for example. You know, but I admire the idea that we work for the community, Jerome, not for institution. You know, we dip in here and there to get resource and knowledge, uncommon knowledge. I like that idea. But we are committed to mobilize the wisdom, the intelligence from the academy and make it available for working class common American. Because you know what? We are American. A classic immigrant that came here, worked hard. I remember my family landed in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. You know, in the end of 1979, 1980, where it was nothing but white people and deer. You know, and my family created a cleaning business. We clean wealthy people's home, churches, synagogues, to put kids to go to school and they all doctor and lawyer, I'm the black sheep. But the point is we are committed to get out of that consumption of pigeonhole, you know? We, we're not that way. I see Fanush shaking her head, agreeing with me, thank you so much. So I'm not, I don't have a question. I'm just enjoying this incredible conversation, Jessamine, <laughs> Jerome. So grazie so let's be in touch, okay? Back to you, Nikki. Thank you, Fong. Uh, today is uh, pretty productive indeed. There are a lot of ideas being born out of today's conversation. I wanna thank you both again so much, Jerome and Jessamine and everyone for asking your questions. Uh, but here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Farnoosh Fatih, to the stage. Farnoosh is the author of Great Guns from Canarium 2013, editor of Joan Murray Drafts, Fragments, and Poems from New York Review Books, Poets 2018, and founder of the Young Artists Language and Devotion Alliance. Uh, poems from her forthcoming collection, Granny Cloud, were recently adapted for Dolores Goes to Poetry City, a new play by Darcy Dennigan and staged by the Wilbury Theater. She lives in New York City, and without further ado, Farnoosh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, everyone at The Rail, um, for inviting me. Um, and thank you, Jerome and Jessamine, and all the wonderful people who are here um, and participating in this dialogue. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to close with a poem. And um, yeah, I really, I dedicate this to the, to the work that you're doing. Um, you know, uh, at the rail, but also Jerome and Jessamine and um, as my good friend, Louis Cordero, uh, great Filipino artist, um, uh, taught me my one phrase, um, Magaleng Talaga. <laughs> um, I hope I said that right. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much. So I'll read maybe one or two poems. Um, and this first one is called Fontanelle. Um, which is like the soft spot of the baby's head. Um, okay. It is courtesy of the bantering in the schoolhouse next to which I live that she dies and I want to do this. It is night. The school, the fontanelle, is quiet. 
my stomping ground, the stomping ground of all students rolled up in a deep bow and onto the shelf, the pen from her to her to him and from him to her who sleep in a valley like a gull and the pen rests in its peak. The students are gossiping and tree hugging it, the pen in their sleep that moves in their sleep that I dare not touch. Their hands shake and spider around a word on the table center. It's ponderous, their school word, fontanelle, and growing rounder as it rolls to and fro their hands across the table. Now children, they who take a deep bow and, huh, long before they are finished, they begin. I must not waste the will of God, they cry, their heads plunged whole into the fontanelle, not until we've reached our teacher in her sleep's dark bottom and walked on our hands before our walls, the bird, the cloud, like portraits hung on every side. On the doleful floor whose earth gives way so easily to waters, we often mistake the stair for a ripple, purple. It seems to make the very ground we awkwardly are in a jig with out to be our mockery. And further down, our hands and graves feel the silk hall pass of the earth and the slippers of the worm. And though we could not see us move like our teacher moves, it was later written that we had stood long before our portraits, that our feet were moving joyfully, juggling the chins of clouds, though our faces were weeping, pining for our teacher and the old tree with hands behind its back, tied with mourning doves that are, so to speak, resting there, ripely balancing for all time and mourning what has been done to them, what clouds have written out in nasty font, their double chins in flames. It is then the center of the table opens up, round with our tears, tears that softly clo cloth the table, then our chests open for the laughing gall, or the morning dove, with the pen eyes, white stitch, diving to dip us in our wells. So that's one poem, well, maybe one more. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so that was kind of like a, what I think is of as like a done poem. And so and then I've been experimenting this pandemic year with reading kind of what I would call like poems barely rescued from the trash, but then recognizing that they have something that I didn't recognize before when I threw them away. And so reading those trash poems, I thought I would end with one of those. So um, three fish left, this doesn't have a title yet. Suggestions welcome. Three fish leapt like three eyes. Where shall I drop my wick, said a leap. On what pad shall I set time between my legs? That I'm living for all, which includes me, which I am, looking on, eases what I am. Is this your father's seat on which a spine is drying? Your, an ornament is near. Bird come to take me high where my parents' signatures hang like banners in outer space, blimp space? on what walls. When I look down at what I must eat or read by light or attempt to tweeze the cherry from the comma, every gesture faces completion. My eye coin tosses, open and shut, seeing and not, that all the arrows of the grass are released. And the droppings, seeing the green blades of seeing coming for me, the way I was not held or held on my breath, I drop a pleasant country wave, hypercoloring my greeting. Something I can't do is there. It's getting late. Now I've seen too much. Veins, a flaming laundry line hung with a bodybuilder's marvelous underthings, the scant underthings of quiet. Tush now, tis so exotic. Like the cuisine of sleepwalkers, chewing in their chambers pauses. What pauses in them to listen to? Don't call it craft. I don't. It's called sleep eating. Pearls, soap bars, a boyfriend pillow pushed from the long intestine. Half horse of promises, I heard them made late, lax, stretching like a word, over a puddle so that a pregnant balloon animal may cross the water or drum like the rain thinking, tapping on the chin. One good, one's good hand is gloved, reaching for the balloon compartment, but that is about time. The time kept quiet by the town's power top, porter, doing a jig on a virgin stool, while the organ pipes blow to keep balloon eyelashes from touching, keeling the floor. The porter's head, meanwhile, should rise this way, useless for looking through lunar sliding doors of people out at the people themselves and whistling what songs know best, like he's supposed to. Such a dowry, his head in the mountaintops lame with many gold fish for eyelids, eyelids that are surely lifting, but who could make out a symbol? I show you now, 
the balloon branded in the horse's side. It is inflating with what will be my morning breath, so on your special day you can know it. Nunchucks, how kind I was, you exclaimed, and to me, turning red, turning blue, the bloated fished out oranges rolling about my snaking arms, living bee ball hoops for pearls and waterfall manes or falling mane waters braid on two fingers that point to the eyes, yours and braid and weed and stand in a plane made of a house of cards flies overhead and the sea gets more profound. But who wouldn't do the same for one who has eaten her soap and her pearls? Every organ moves out of the way as if for a pregnant balloon animal, putting pens to the mountain's head a pen like a horse chiseled to a vein, the flies ride, rainbow hued, and I walk toward where I must drive my signature, under the flaming laundry line, hung with the bodybuilders marvelous under things, the scant under things of quiet, tush now to so exotic in your hands, in your eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Farnoosh. Thank you for joining us today and for sharing your poetry with us. And I'm glad that one was saved from the waste bin. Um, I wanna thank everyone else again for joining us today. Um, we have these events every day at 1 p.m. So join us tomorrow for a conversation between Hashim Sarkis, curator of the 17th International Architecture Exhibition of the 2021 Venice Biennale with rail editor at large, Paul D. Miller, AKA TJ Spooky. As always, we will conclude with a poetry reading and um, you all now can turn on your microphones to say hello and uh, happy Monday. Thanks, Jessamine. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Jerome and Jessamine. Thank Thanks, Benush. Thank you very much for such a wonderful event. Thank you, you guys. Poetry ending. Thank you, Jessamine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Jessamine. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all. See you next time. You killed it. Oh, can I do my way? I'm so good. <laughs> great.